what do we do in the middle of the coronavirus epidemic? What it's very tempting to do, and what many people are doing, is to analyze the flaw, analyze the flaws in the government's policy, analyze the flaws in capitalism, show how what, what has happened is a result of capitalism, uh, get together left-wing think tanks, environmental think tanks for drawing up plans for what we will what we should do and wait for the outpouring of political sentiment from the left and from the grassroots that's going to come up at the end of this epidemic when we can return to political life as we know it, in which we feel we can do something. This is a disastrous mistake. What we need to do in this, ep in this pandemic is to be active immediately and all the way through the pandemic. And what we need to be active about, our guiding light has to be the same thing it is with climate change. How do we save as many human lives as possible? We also have to do this always in an international setting. Much of the political discussion that happens, happens in terms of what happens in Britain. But we're dealing with a global virus that moves much faster from Milan to London and New York than it does from London to Edinburgh. We're dealing with a global virus. We're coming right after a worldwide series of revolts in about 11 countries in the world, Hong Kong, Chile, Lebanon, Sudan, and so on. Massive grassroots revolts of a new kind. Um, the, the world was full of us that came into this. And as we came into this, we had ma a mass, a new kind of mass global right wing elected government movements of Trump and Duterte and Modi and um, Johnson and, um, uh, and so on. Uh, not only that, when we, uh, we are now seeing a global recession global stock market uh, crash and we are on the edge of a global financial crisis that will be worse than 2008 and when we come out of this all of those things all of economic circumstances will still be there moreover when we come out of it we want to be we want to do something about climate change and climate change because the air <laughs> carbon dioxide goes everywhere in the atmosphere Climate change is a global problem that affects all of us, and it can only be solved collectively and globally. We have to start from different places. But also, the political atmosphere, as we come to the end of the epidemic, as we've lived through this, the political atmosphere will be decisively different because of the things that people have done and the experiences that we have had all over the world. And we will be reacting to and following in many, many cases, what people are doing in the rest of the world. But also, if you look at how governments have reacted to this, they have, in every case, <laughs> been watching how all the other governments are reacting to it and learning from each other and saying to themselves, we cannot do what they are doing or we must do what they are doing and so on. So always think internationally and globally. This is a new adventure for the human species. Okay. Now, when I say that we have to be active in the, about the pandemic, about the virus now, it's because the struggle doesn't start when the lockdown ends and the people who are going to die have died. The struggle starts now. This is the first of a series of struggles, a series of crises that produce struggle that are going to happen over the next two or three or four decades because we're living in the era of climate change. This is a beginning, and horrible as it is, this is a relatively easy and gentle practice run. The worst prognosis is that 40 million people will die. We may well get away with 10 or 20 million. That is a horrific event, but compared to what's coming, it's a practice run. Now, 
when I say what we fight for, what we fight for is we fight to save lives. And you have to look at the epidemic, read the read what the doctors and the experts are writing, and figure out what are the absolutely crucial things. Um, I've been writing about this in The Ecologist. The absolutely crucial things to save lives are first to have enough ventilators. When people get really sick, they need a ventilator or they die. Where the virus has gotten a hold, where it has reached its peak, um, there are nothing like enough ventilators. And most people who need to be ventilated are simply sedated and left to die. Um, and what they do is they treat the youngest and the strongest because that's the decision that's going to save the most lives because those people will get well more quickly. They reached this situation in Wuhan. Um, they reached it in North Italy. They reached it in Madrid. They've now reached it in London, parts of London, and they've now reached it in New York. Um, in this situation, it's not just the effect of the coronavirus, it's that there are at least as many deaths from the people who are not being treated. Um, and a very large proportion of cancer patients, heart patients, and so on, are simply not being treated. In order to get those people into intensive care, they have to throw out the people who are currently in intensive care. Okay, so we need ventilators. And particularly in the rich countries, particularly in Britain and the United States are the places where we have the least ventilators. We have the least ventilators because the governments of the right made a bet. They knew what was coming and they knew it would be both an epidemic that killed a lot of people and that it would cause, it would kickstart a global recession that was coming anyway, a global stock market fall that was coming anyway, and it might threaten a global financial crisis. So Putin and Trump and Johnson in the rich countries decided to let the virus rip in order to preserve the economy. Because they decided to do this, there was no possibility of them preparing us. It's not incompetence. They could only prepare us by telling everybody what was coming. And if they did that, people would tell them, don't let the virus rip. So they couldn't prepare for it. But also, still, now that it's happening, they cannot send the army into the factories. They cannot take over the factories. They cannot simply, we, in the United States, 10 million people lost their jobs in the last two weeks. Um, and those people are not making, uh, making them. So there's that. There's the ventilators. Second, um, second there's the lockdowns. We won a lockdown in this country. We turned, um, uh, we turned Johnson around. They've won a lockdown in the United States. The Republican governors, the Republican mayors are all switching over to a lockdown. Trump won't do it. But the enormous force of popular opinion has uh, forced them to do it. But in the, the lockdown that we have in Britain is a, it's a beautiful thing to watch because it is, <laughs> it's organized collective love on a massive scale. It's the people who are very, very unlikely to die. We're taking care of those who are in real danger like me. It's a beautiful thing to watch. But in much of the world, what you have now is a lockdown where people are losing their jobs and they have no incomes and they cannot eat because they need a day's work or a week's work to, to eat the next week. They cannot eat. Their families cannot eat. A hundred million migrant workers are trying to walk home hundreds of miles in India with nothing to eat. In South Africa, South Africa is now full of millions upon millions and millions of people. There are a lot of people in the United States who are hungry and those 10 million people who lost their jobs in the last two weeks, they all lost their health care insurance as well at the moment they lost their job. In this situation, people resist. The 
individual and organized looting of supermarkets that we're seeing in Sicily now. It's going to be much more general. More people have been shot by the South African police for going out of the house so far than have died of the coronavirus. The brutality of the South African police and far worse the Indian police is, is terrible. And people, people in the slums, people in the townships are being left to die, packed together in very, very large numbers. In this situation, the fight to get those people a living, the fight to get those people food is, is also the fight to have the lockdown. <laughs> It's the fight to save everybody's life, because if we cannot get those people food, if the governments are not forced to feed those people, then the lockdowns will not hold. Do not believe for a moment the people who tell you, well, of course, the people in the global south are going to suffer more. These terrible things are happening in South Africa. South Africa has the same per capita income as China, where these terrible things have not happened. They're happening in the United States, one of the richest countries in the world. India is not a rich country, but India has the resources to feed all its people if the Indian army did wish to do so. We have to understand that this is a kind of class vengeance that's happening here. This will produce enormous upsurge and enormous revolt. In that revolt, we must be on the side of the people breaking the curfew breaking the lockdown so that they can eat. Because only if they do that, only if there are food riots and looting and all of that, will they force the governments to do what needs to be done. Okay, now that may seem visionary because in this situation, can you tell me when I have six minutes to go, Pete? Okay. Um, in this situation, um, we're so used to being beaten up by governments, so used to it. But we founded nationally a Protect the People organization three weeks ago to get Johnson to close the schools and have a lockdown of the country. We won the schools in five days. We won the closed down and locked down the whole country in nine days. When, and we won it, of course, because we were among hundreds of thousands <laughs> of people doing this. And because the governments are petrified because they know they're coming out of this with an enorm with a large number of people dead, and they're coming out of this with economic collapse, which will continue after the virus. I can explain why later if you want. And both of theirs are there for. So they're petrified. That's why we can move them. That's why there's a very big um, campaign in South Africa of all the organizations of civil society fighting to force the government to give everyone in South Africa a grant of enough rain to buy enough food to eat. I think they're probably going to win. Because the consequences for the, the governments, if they don't, are so terrible. Um, Republicans in the United States, grassroots Republicans now, over, by very large margins, support lockdowns. Um, it is, the, our rulers are facing crises of their career, but crises of their economic system and crises of their legitimacy. And neoliberalism as an ideological form is dead. In this situation, even in a lockdown, even when we're just, a lot of us are just doing it, aren't working and are just doing it on the internet, we have enormous power. Do not underestimate this power. Um, if you want to look at the underestimation, look at, what, look at what's happened to the left and the Labour Party in this country. People wonder why is, why is, why is Boris Johnson popular? Why does he have so much support? Well, he has so much support because Jeremy Corbyn didn't call for a lockdown. Jeremy Corbyn didn't call for taking over factories to make ventilators. Keir Starmer didn't call for it. Len McCluskey didn't call for it. No union leader in the country called for it. Boris Johnson did it. What, he, what happened is that in this crisis, Boris Johnson was to the left of Corbyn. And Merkel was way to the left of Boris Johnson, pulling him along. 
That's because the Labour Party has reached such a point and the memberships reach that we've all reached such a point that we think they can walk all over us. They can't walk all over us now. Because I was part of the movement to make Johnson do this. When he gave his speech, I felt fantastic. I felt we've won it. We made it. We won it. We as a people, we've done this thing. An awful lot of Labour Party members I know feel, why do people support Johnson? They feel demoralized by the experience. That, that's why we fuck now. Now, all over the country, those people are going to be learning. Those people are going to be learning and they're going to be changing. When we come out of this, when we come out of this, I will come back to climate at this point, because when we come out of this, we're coming out into enormous levels of unemployment. Many bust six minutes. Um, we're coming out into very high levels of unemployment, enormous numbers of people who must have jobs. We're coming in a situation where everybody has learned that neoliberalism is useless, that when you want something done, government action has to do it. About climate change, everybody has learned the experts are right. And you must take action before you hit the crisis. And they've learned that governments can be made to so there will be the people who need the jobs. There will be the, an, an, an enormous feeling for action about climate. And the solution will be climate jobs. Will be take a million people, a million and a half people, two million people, take them right off the dole and put them to work and do it right now. And another thing we've learned, don't wait for the private sector to do it. This becomes not a long-term demand. This is something that we can get back on, that when we get back on the streets, we're running on the streets for. And this is something that we can elect governments that will do it, or we can change the governments that will do it. We will be in an entirely different political situation from the one that all of us in this call have been in for most of our lives. Okay. I want to... I want to finish with three things. First of all, move forward. It's not a matter of having unity of the left or unity of the environmental movements. There will be enormous numbers of your people. Our heroes will be the shop workers, the cleaners, the nurses, the people who've risked their lives for us, the people who have been caring. Those people, particularly the people in the hospitals who had to choose who got the ventilator and who died, and who held the hands of the people who died, those people will lead us, lead us collectively. The people who fought for lockdowns that work in the global south in the United States, those people will lead us. Those people are thinking as they have never thought before in their lives. They will, be, they will be central to the mass movement we build. This will be a mass movement. This is a great historical event. And in this great historical event, people will learn and people will change. One thing we have to think like crazy about is how we can support people in countries where there is a lockdown and people have no food. How can we, what can we do for that struggle? I don't know the answer to that yet, but I know someone is gonna find out. <laughs> Someone somewhere is going to find out what we do, and then we will do it. People in historically unique situations, people come up with new situations from the grassroots. The wonderful thing about the internet is we mobilize those enormously as far as we can. And we learn from what people are doing. We learn, uh, no, I'll, I'll end with kindness, because the other thing is be very careful about assuming it's all going to go our way because there will also be an enormous movement of the right. But it won't be a movement of the neoliberal austerity right. That's gone. I think that's gone. Some people try that, but I think that's gone. It will be a, a movement of, um, it, I think it will be a movement that will be racist, that will be nationalistic, but 
that will also be a movement against austerity. If you look at the single, the single most economically successful politician in the 1930s was Adolf Hitler. And what he led was a racist, murderous, warmongering movement against austerity by the Social Democrats in Germany. We must absolutely be prepared for that. And we must absolutely, and the argument will come at us again and again, because you tried to save all these lives of the old people, you ruined the economic lives of everybody else. Watch for this argument being spread out of Russia, out of the United States, and so on. This will be coming at us. But the last thing is, the thing that's probably easiest for both environmentalists and leftists, like everybody on this call is one of those two things, or I know, uh, often both, it's easy for us to underestimate the importance of kindness, the political centrality of kindness. And what we have seen is not only that the lock-ins are an exercise in mass kindness, all of the, every time, every time somebody writes to me and says, how are you, Jonathan? <laughs> Just reaching out, do you need anything? And so on, I'm, I'm touched. I'm really very touched. The kindness, in the self-help groups, the kindness in the constant conversations, the fact that the people who are leading our reaction to this, the doctors and nurses and cleaners, are people whose lives, whose life work is kindness. We are going to have to understand the centrality of that, that when people come out of this, there will be quite rightly enormous rage against the people who did not care for us before and did not care for us during. There will be enormous rage, be quite general. But there will also be an enormous emphasis on kindness, which is why every, every bit of time we spend in the self-help groups, talking to the person at the allotment who's living alone, <laughs> all those kinds of things, all those bits and pieces will be of decisive importance in building the kind of movement we want to build because, and this is the ending point, what we want to do about climate change is we want the human species as a whole to, take, to change the world so that we can take care of each other and so that we can take care of every living thing. This will be a movement of rape of rage, but even more, this will be a movement of kindness. And history has decisively changed, and the long struggle has begun now. Thank you.